everyone. I'm Selina Siak chin Yoke, the author of The Woman Who Breathed Two Worlds, a debut novel that was released worldwide on November 1st, 2016 by Amazon Crossing. In this video, I'll tell you a little bit about my book and also read an excerpt. The Woman Who Breathed Two Worlds is about a mixed race woman, a woman whose life straddles two worlds, a Malay world and a Chinese world, hence the title. The book follows her through her life journey and in this way unfolds to becoming a story about family, food, friendship and most of all identity. In particular the challenge of forging an Asian identity in a world that is rapidly westernizing. The section I'm going to read you takes place a little way into the story when the protagonist, whose name is Chai Hun, has already started a business making cakes, or kue in Malay. I chose this passage because I believe that it will give you a feel for the mix of prose there is in my book, part descriptive, part lyrical, and also part action-oriented. And most of all, I hope it will give you an idea about the type of personality the main character is. Now I must warn you, that there is an expletive in the middle. If you're faint-hearted, fear not. These are the only two swear words in the book of nearly 500 pages. So, we're in British Malaya. The year is 1910. The heroine has just started her business, making quay. Now, in those days, few women ran businesses, and even fewer traipsed through town, hauling quay on their shoulders for sale. So the protagonist hits on the idea of hiring a coolie to sell her quay for her. The coolie's name is Abwe, and this is what happens next. In the following months, our cakes continued to be popular. Abwe returned at the end of each morning, his load lighter, with only the odd cake left inside his carriers. I altered the menu daily so that the coolie was constantly supplied with fresh varieties of quay, a device I hoped would prevent our customers from becoming bored. Then a decline crept in. It happened so slowly that for a time I didn't notice anything amiss. The number of coins Arboy handed me dwindled, but I put this down to the vagaries of business. When sales fell, I took less pleasure in money counting what had once filled me with nervous energy turned into a chore I put off till the evenings, after we had finished dinner. Inevitably, the day came when almost no quay had been sold, and Arboy returned with his carriers still full. Something inside me crumbled then. I had a sense that all was not what it seemed, a hunch I could not possibly have explained to anyone else. I wanted someone to follow Arboy on his rounds. Knowing that the person could not be me, I turned to Siulan for help, and she suggested her junior servant. Thus it was that Rokya, a Malay woman who had worked in Siulan's household for many years, was let loose to track Arboy as he left our house one morning. Pretending to be a washerwoman, she tailed him for a week she told us that he went first to Leed Street, where she saw him entering a shop she thought was an opium den, carrying his pole and baskets inside. He remained there for hours, forcing her to loiter in the market and at different eating stalls until he staggered out with a hazy look on his face. At the end of each morning, when I questioned Arbwe, he looked at me shiftily the downward, guilty cast of those slanted eyes was unmistakable. And though I gave the wretched man every opportunity to confess, he never did. After a week, Father and I walked to Leed Street. It was a wide street with sturdy double-storey shop houses lining both sides, each fronted by a common corridor, the ubiquitous five-foot way running along the entire line of shops. Being at the heart of the Chinese quarter, Leed Street and its five-foot waist bustled at all hours of the day or night. 
and it was no different that morning. The usual assortment of characters crowded our way. Women in Chinese tunics and trousers returning from the market with woven baskets filled to the brim. Men in Mandarin collared jackets rushing by. And hawkers. So many hawkers everywhere. Squatting on the five-foot way or on the sides of the street itself. Customers squatted alongside, their faces stuck behind ceramic bowls. The wonderful aroma of freshly cooked food filled the air. Smells my sharp nose told me came from Chinese delicacies. Dumplings being steamed and rice flour cakes roasted, tau fu being deep fried and eggs prepared the double beaten way. It was noisy too. Apart from the hawkers yelling to the world what they sold, loud conversation drifted out from the coffee shops, spiced by the odd raucous shout. It didn't take long to spot Rokia, because not many Malays ventured into town, and few were ever seen on Leed Street. Rokia, with the beautiful double-creased eyes of her ancestors, and lashes that flicked naturally upwards, waved to us from across the street, as she pointed towards the shop Arbway had entered. I thanked Rokia, telling her she was at liberty to return home. As father and I approached the door of the shop to which she had pointed, the clanking of mahjong tiles could be heard. The sounds came from a shop nearby, one which had its doors and windows thrown wide open, despite being a gambling parlour. Before long, Choice words spoken in the Hakka dialect reached our ears. Eh, hey, fuck your mother's stinking cunt. I felt the heat rise in my cheeks. Two men stumbled out, pushing and shoving one another, leaving behind the din of tables crashing and cups being broken. The terrifying clatter shook me, as did the sight of coolies in tattered rags pummeling each other with their fists. My heart beat faster even though the brawl had nothing to do with us. The men were soon separated and led away, and normal, brisk activity resumed in that corner of Leech Street. With my heart still pounding, I walked into Arbway's opium den with father. As soon as we entered, I began to understand the attraction of the drug. There was a cloying odour in the room, sweet and sickly. When it invaded my body, my head felt faint. In such a cloud, I could see why people imagined their troubles disappearing. When I asked for Arbway, we were told there was no such person there. It was only when I raised my voice that the man relented, agreeing finally to show us into a room where Arbway lay in a stupor. The rooms weren't dark and dingy as I had supposed, but bright and remarkably inviting. I hauled Arboy up by both shoulders and shook him. This is how you repay me up, ha? Huh? I shouted. So this is why no one buys our quay. The miserable coolie woke up in an instant, as if he had risen from a bad dream. Bing Chun Sao, Bing Chun Sao, he spluttered. Though father didn't say anything, it was reassuring to have him there. He looked like an ancient sage, an impression accentuated by the dignified silence that accompanied his slight stoop and completely white head. No one would dare lift a finger so long as his figure, which still towered over most men's, stood beside me. Not that I felt afraid. When it came to defending my children, the flame in me rose up, unabated. You, no need to come back, you lousy person's head, I told Arboy in no uncertain terms. You owe me money, but I know that you, one cent not even got. Today your wage also, I no give. You, die even better, la. With that, I lifted the pole Arboy had cast to one side. Father and I strode out with our baskets of quay, 
leaving astonished whispers behind. That's the end of the reading. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope it has given you an interest to read my book. Bye-bye.